Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 13 of Luminosity of Free Software. Uh, this week, we have a pair of topics. I picked just two because they're both a little bit big uh, compared to the topics I sometimes cover, and I thought, well, let's keep it fairly short. Um, I'm actually joined here in the home office by Marco, who is currently off screen. Marco Martin, uh, who also works on Plasma, he's up for a few days from Italy to uh, work on hardware stuff um, on the Vivaldi tablet bring up. Um, so yes, he's sitting over there fiddling around with bits of hardware and uh, sticking his tongue out at me at the moment. So this week we, um, like I said, we have a pair of topics. Uh, we're going to be looking at open build service and we're also going to be looking at the question of why we work together and why sometimes we don't in free software, in which I'll try to make the case that right now we might be over-diversified and it might be a good idea to step back and think about the amount of diversity we have in, in free software right now, at least on, on the desktop side. So we'll jump right in and we'll start with open build service. And as usual, welcome everyone who is um, either in the uh, Hangout on Google+, following the live stream on YouTube, or in the IRC channel on irc.freenode.net in hash luminosity. And there's a few people in there right now. So hello to everybody. So the first topic, uh, open build service. What is it? Well, if you're building a distribution, you need to build packages. And in this day and age, no one's really going to want to build all the packages on their simple home machine. Uh, they're going to want a bunch of servers somewhere that are chewing through packages. And this is for a lot of reasons. Number one, there's just a ton of free software out there these days, thousands and thousands of packages. There's a number of distributions distributions that sport anywhere from you know four or five thousand different software packages up to like ten or eleven thousand. Um, so there's a lot of free software, a lot of packages, and they all need to be built. Um, additionally, a lot of distributions target more than one architecture. They'll have uh, you know versions that are optimized for different uh, families of the Intel architecture and more and more are now targeting uh, what used to be considered more exotic uh, architectures but which are pretty common these days such as ARM that's probably the most common but there's also ones that target MIPS and if you look at Debian you can see pretty much all the different uh, chips that are out there or families of, of hardware that are out there. So you really end up wanting a lot of servers that you can say, here's a package, build it for a bunch of different platforms with a bunch of different targets. And at the end of it, can you please make me an image uh, that I can then send to you know, an FTP server somewhere that people can then download and install. And in the process of this, you tend to end up, I imagine, I never actually run a distribution, but I've watched people do it a number of times, and you end up building a build farm. Uh, with a bunch of servers that are chewing through packages, performing tests, um, etc. So Open Build Service actually started at SUSE, and it was their answer to this set of problems. And they actually saw an opportunity when, actually it's back, I think, when they're still owned by Novell, they saw an opportunity with this really, you know, large and extensive uh, tool set they had created. And that was that they they really could not be the only group out there that wanted to make a disk image of an OS that you could install. And so they did a pair of, of products around their infrastructure uh, software they had built. One was Open Build Service, which is that manage the build farm, um, all of your servers, get packages up, uh, etc. And the other one was SUSE Studio, which allowed you to really easily build little appliances. Uh, in, in terms of little images that you could then de uh, deploy and test even online. So we're going to be looking at the open build service side of it today. It is free software, of course, otherwise we would not be covering it uh, in this, sh in this uh, show. Um, so the URL is openbuildservice.org. And what I really like about it, um, besides being very capable, is that it isn't exclusive to SUSE, it's not even exclusive to RPM-based distros. Uh, it currently supports both RPM and Debian package-based distributions, uh, but it's also able to be extended. So if you download the source code for it and you take a look, you'll see that they actually have backends for all the different parts 
of the system uh, so that you can use it in, uh, to target different hardware architectures, different package formats, um, etc. So I'll actually throw up the, the website really quick um, on the, let's see here. Share if I can find it. There it is. Too many windows open. Or as soon as the uh, screen share decides to. Let me select it. There it is. Great. So here's openbuildservice.org. Um, and it is, as it says, it's comprehensive, collaborative, open source. Great, great, great. If you go to the download section, just to kind of demonstrate um, how, you know, uh, how much variety there is in the support it offers. It you know has a very simple installation. You can download an appliance, which you can then run in a virtual machine um, or on an actual machine if you wish. That actually has OBS already set up, and you just basically download the uh, appliance, boot it, and you can start playing with OBS. Uh, um, there is documentation for configuration. Um, there's the what they call the reference server, which is build.opensuse.org. So they actually use this to uh, drive and put together the OpenSUSE distribution. And if you've gone to the OpenSUSE site, uh, you'll see that there is a software search. And when you search there for you know, whatever package you're looking for, it often comes up with the number of user um, home projects. And what Open Build Service allows you to do, and you'll see this on the reference server, and we'll take a look at it a bit more when we look at the actual server, but it allows people in your community to set up their own projects, upload their own packages, and start building things for people. Um, this is very similar to uh, PPMs that we know from Debian derived distros. Um, it's the same kind of concept. So it supports that as well. And if you look down below, so uh, backing up just a second, so the reference server and the packages they offer for default download are for SUSE. But at the bottom, you, it, you can see it says select your operating system. And it has quite a good number. It has CentOS, Debian, Fedora, Mandriva, OpenSUSE, RHEL, uh, Scientific Linux, SUSE Linux Enterprise, and Ubuntu. And if you select, let's select Debian, for instance, um, it shows you how to do it. In fact, in this case, um, you can actually do it directly via apt-get, which is really cool. There's a command line tool here um, called OSC, which uh, is the command line driver for open uh, for the open build service? I'll only look at the the website because we don't have. I don't want to spend you know a whole hour on this one project. It's huge though, um, and so a lot of times when developers are working with this, they simply from their 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 console um, use the OSC command line to trigger package rebuild, send. Um, uh, new repos up uh, into projects, uh, re you know, tell it, okay, now please build me an image, etc. So there are packages for a wide number of distributions, which is really, really cool. And of course, you can download the, um, the source code if you want. Um, and it's magically in a you know, open Git repository. So, and actively developed, which is always a benefit. The manual I found was quite good. They have PDF, EPUB, um, as well as online HTML. Some of the bits I found weren't weren't completed. Uh, so I think that'd be a great way to contribute to this is by finishing out some of the manual bits. But it's pretty comprehensive um, already, um, as is. Sorry, I'm just gonna have to. Just notice my, the battery on my laptop is starting to go down, so I'm just going to plug in real quick. Awkward. There we go. That should ensure that I don't go blank halfway through the show. Um, so there's a good manual. Uh, there's support. Uh, as well, online support. So if you have questions and whatnot, all the usual stuff you'd expect from a free software project. So what does it look like? Well, I, I come across a number of people that have made the assumption that because it's open build service and it comes from SUSE and there's build.opensuse.org, that's basically what you have to use. And that the 
uh, open source version of it is just you know maybe some kind of Trojan horse thing that they throw out over the over the wall, hoping other people will use it. But they're actually really quite serious about getting people in other projects and other communities using it. Um, I know this because I've actually talked with people in their team in person um, in their offices and whatnot. And so this is a really important thing for them. They've tried to make it as deployable as possible, which is a really nice uh, difference, I think, compared to some of the other tools we've seen um, from some other distros where they basically throw it over the fence and it really is not something that you can you know, realistically deploy in your own machines. So in the MER project, which we use uh, for Plasma Active, as you know, um, we have a instance of the Open Build service. We use it. Uh, before MER was using it, Migo was also using it. So this is kind of just a natural progression. Uh, it's not a very big farm that we have right now. We'll grab, jump real quick over to the status monitor. Um, you can see KD Workspace and KD PIM runtime are currently building on two of the five hosts we have. Um, it shows each core, what's running on them. Um, you can take a look at the architectures. So we've got uh, six architectures that we build for on this service. Um, and yeah, you just get an overview of what's what's been going on. And of course, the status of things. Where it really gets ex interesting is, of course, when you go to... Actually, let me go to my home. So this is, this is my login here, but I'm going to go to my home project. Um, and it shows that I have no packages yet. Um, you can report bugs right inside, which is kind of neat. Uh, you can create packages, create a sub-project. So this is my home project. You can create as many projects as you want. Um, so you can create a package, and we'll give it a name here really quick. Completely made up. Good enough. Oh, right, this is the package name. There we go. Good. And once I go in, so now it takes me directly to the package, which is now part of my, my home project. Um, you can edit things, delete it. You can also add, uh, if we go to the sources, we can add a service for source processing. You can also use OSC from the command line to push things. And it's very much favored towards Git at the moment. Um, you can create a tarball from a Git repository or a clone from a Git package uh, or using Git package. Um, otherwise, you have to upload files directly. So you can build a tar or make a tarball if you're using some other uh, system for revision control. And then you can just mm -hmm. upload the file manually or do it with uh, OSC from the command line. Repositories are the actual repositories in open build service. So these are the things that people who would be using this, um, the, the packages on their system would add to their uh, repositories, their apt-get or zipper or yum uh, repository set. It also shows revisions, requests, the users that are involved, because you can share projects, obviously. And so to give you an example of the projects we have running um, on the uh, MER project uh, build service. We have what you would expect. We have the MER stuff, the Nemo stuff, the KDE Plasma Active. Um, we've got it targeting different versions of OpenSUSE and Debian as well. So that's really quite cool. And each of these projects will have um, or may have a number of repositories in them, and most of them have quite a few packages. So it's because the entire operating system. And then using this, you can then also uh, generally through OSC build a really nice um, automated, or in a nice automated fashion, build a image that then people can download. So it's a really, really competent, capable system that's built around the idea of community collaboration, building packages uh, right from either source repositories or uh, you know, via tarballs, so the usual. Um, it really automates everything and completely takes our mind in, you know, because in Plasma Active we actually create images, which was a new thing for us because we typically were just making, you know, source repositories, you know, tarballs out of our repositories for, for KDE stuff. Um, and now we're building, you know, entire operating system images, not exactly our area of expertise, but open build service handles all the details for us and makes it really, really, really super simple. Um, in fact, with 
the Nemo project, which also creates images based on Mer, we share uh, the description files that are used to build images um, so that we can share targeting for different, because we basically for every ARM uh, device uh, that you have out there, there's you need a different kernel and a different configuration, and it's a mess. Um, and so doing these hardware adaptations is a fair amount of work, and it's fiddly and annoying, and you actually have to have the device so you can test it on it. Um, and so by, by using the same build service, uh, we're able to share these hardware adaptations between the different projects that build up on top of MER. And I think that's a great thing about uh, OBS is that it enables that, that collaboration between groups. And the fact that it's completely open, uh, available for use, and yeah, very performant, has all the bells and whistles you'd expect from that which is used to make one of the, the uh, you know, top uh, five distros um, out there. So if you're in the business of making distros or making packages or you have a project like uh, Mer or Nemo or Plasma Active, I definitely recommend that you take a look at it. Cool, so now we'll jump to the next topic, which is a little more philosophical, if you will. And that is the topic of working together in free software. And it was really interesting because I decided I wanted to talk about this in this show a few days ago. And there was a few things that kind of triggered it. One was I was, I've been watching the number of distros that have been popping up recently. And the number of those distros that have been doing, Linux distributions that is, that have been doing their own thing uh, completely their own thing, whether that's, you know, oh, I'm going to do my own desktop environment or I'm going to, you know, have our own package format or whatever. And this just seems to be following a, you know, a trend at the moment. I don't think it will last forever, but a trend at the moment where there's a lot of diversification happening um, between within free software. So we're seeing, you know, desktop projects for this way and that. We've seen database servers um, going in different directions, and we're also seeing distributions. And there was there's a really, really great um, presentation done every year at Linux Fest Northwest uh, called Why Linux Sucks. And I, I really tend to hate, you know, negative um, approaches to things. Um, but uh, Brian Lunduk, I think, does a really good job of it. He is not a flame bait talk he does. It's really good. He also does a Why Linux Doesn't Suck, Why It Rocks presentation at the same time, well, right after it. So you know, there's good balance there, yin and yang. But this, this year's presentation that he did really was all about why do we have so much variety? And it's a really good question. Now, obviously, variety is not in on its own bad. Monoculture is not a good thing. It's not like we want a single you know, entrant for every category. Because then, yes, we end up with a monoculture. It does a number of things. One, it means that there is a larger security target. It makes it harder for the bad guys to you know, take advantage of, of flaws and harder for the good guys to respond. Um, it also tends to retard progress and innovation because people are people and if you don't have other groups trying new and interesting things that maybe you wouldn't have thought about or doing it in a way that you might not not, not have done and it creates this friendly you know it's sometimes non-friendly but often friendly competition that spurs progress so having you know a couple of entrants in each category is great it allows us to experiment we don't have to get it right the first time we can get it right one of you know the three or four things that are going on. And if one project goes sideways or off the you know, deep end, then we have the other you know, products to, to fall back on. So I'm not saying we should have just one you know, thing in each category, but I do wonder if there's a bit over diversification at the moment. And I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of step back for a moment and, and ask the question that's at the root of it, at least in my, my thinking, which is, why do we bother to work together in the first place? And why don't we at times? So the why is pretty simple. I mean, besides the fact that it's enjoyable to work with other people, um, there really is the base truth that one person can only do so much on their own. 
And if you expand that to five or six people, you do more or you can accomplish more as a team of five or six people than you would even as five or six individuals. Right? It's that kind of holistic thinking, sum is greater than the whole, you know, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But really what it comes down to is when you put people together, we uh, create better results in sum. We inspire each other, we challenge each other, we, when some one person in the group has you know, an incorrect uh, answer to something or not the best idea, others probably do. And so you just make better progress. And that really revolves around the, the whole base concept of why we work together. Free software did something fantastically magical. So free software or, or software when it, when it was really in its deeply proprietary phase um, during the late 80s through to the you know, second half of the 90s. Uh, we had companies that did have teams of software engineers and they were putting out some good stuff and a lot of not so good stuff, but they were working together. And free software came in, especially with the GPL, I did something really, really fascinating. And then it said, look, here's the thing. I'll work with me if you let me work with you. Basically, that's how I kind of view the GPL. Uh, in terms of from the content creators, not so much. There is a user to uh, con uh, creator relationship there too, but the creator to creator relationship. So we have two people who are making technology. The GPL gives them the, the comfort of, of you know, peace of mind to know that when they give back, what they give into that common pool is not going to be taken away by some other group, um, that everyone is required to work together. Uh, other licenses that are more permissive sometimes are better because you want people to take it away. Other times projects just get so huge that more permissive licensing is fine because no one in the right mind is going to fork the project or proprietize it. Um, but for medium-sized projects or for really big companies, uh, this is a really good incentive and get, got people working together. And when people did come to work together, we got a lot of best-of-breed software, whether it's the Linux kernel that scales from small to big like no other operating ever had, uh, or we get really great, you know, I mentioned databases earlier, or the best web servers in plural now with Nginx um, and Apache, uh, you know, in the world, we get really great software when people come together. The advance of, of Linux um, in all its varieties and flavors and derivatives in the mobile and embedded spaces is completely due to having this huge hotbed of, uh, you know, where people can come together and, and work together. So there's a real benefit. So you would think that at this point, everyone would just go, great, we just work together and let's see how much we can make. Uh, and they wouldn't needlessly or without reason fork, but people do. And that's a really interesting question. Why is this happening more now? And I think and this is my opinion, and please feel free to disagree and, and give me feedback in the comments um, or in the chat areas um, during the show. But I get the feeling that a lot of people in free software have forgotten how much is possible because we have larger groups of people working together. I think a lot of people have forgotten how hard it was back when there was less cooperation. I'm not even talking back to that, you know, highly proprietary era um, of the industry, you know, 80s to late 90s. But, you know, the desktop, uh, you know, if we go back six, seven, eight years, nine years, um, when there was, you know, not nearly as much interoperability, when there was greater, huge gulfs, really, between the different desktop projects in terms of, you know, how easy it was and how realistic it was to use applications from one, you know, desktop project in another desktop environment. And that's really changed. Um, we also have so many more third-party applications that take advantage of this. And without that commonality there, those third-party applications wouldn't be nearly as compelling. And some of them probably just simply wouldn't exist. It would just be a highly balkanized environment and there'd be a lot fewer applications um, and a lot less great ones. So I, I think that there might be some, some cultural loss there. There's also the other side of it, which is that there are companies um, and, and you know, non-corporate organizations as well that have entered the free software space looking at how popular it is, how successful it's been, 
and they're looking to get a piece of that pie. And they're bringing some really old school thinking to it. And the way they think they can get a piece of that pie is to differentiate in what is ultimately a fairly destructive manner. And so they're going to take their effort and do their own thing. And because it's going to be special and different, it will lock people in. It will bring people to their name brand rather than anyone else's. Here's the thing I think that they're missing. Let's assume you do fork a project and you can make it 5% better. The division of labor almost guarantees that your project and the other project are going to both perform far less than whatever gain you're going to add onto it. There are limits. Obviously, you can't just dump hundreds of people onto a project and it will continue to speed up in, 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 uh, uh, in, in forward progress. But generally, when we look around, the diversity we're seeing right now, the what I really do think is over-diversity, um, is simply retarding and slowing down projects. Uh, the projects are, are still moving forward, but not as quickly as they could. It also becomes extremely confusing for third-party developers who are trying to figure out this you know, landscape of, well, what do I use? What do I target? What do I rely on? Uh, one of the other really great benefits, not only do you create more, but there is that trust that comes with the knowledge that if there are five groups working on something versus one group or even two groups working on something, uh, if one of those five groups goes away, no big problem, there's four others. I'm not you know, putting all my eggs in one basket. I'm not gonna end up maintaining this software myself or having to migrate to something else. Rather, whereas if there's just a couple of people working on it, it becomes a riskier venture and therefore there's less, less uh, trust in it, adoption slows, and the inevitable happens, which, which is that you fewer users, fewer users, fewer developers, fewer developers, things move slower. So this is real erosion um, in the, the progress and the quality of free software when there's over diversification. And it's really trying to find, it's almost like a maximization uh, problem. What is the largest, smallest group that we can have of uh, competing or diverse project, projects in the same space, whereby they can all move forward at a maximal rate without feeling the drag of having too much balkanization. Um, I'll be frank, I think we don't need more than one, and this is going to be completely heretical, I don't think we need more than one package, manage, package format. I really don't. I think that the days of having RPM and DEB and whatever else you want to throw on the table uh, stopped making sense a decade ago. It's a lot of work to migrate from one to the other, but there's no benefit of one over the other. Now, I'm not talking about apt-get and zipper and all these other things. I just don't th see any purpose to the package formats. I don't think we need multiple display servers. I do think we need a couple of database servers. I do think we need a couple of, of uh, web servers. I do think that we need you know, a multiplicity of programming languages. I do think we need a few desktop environments. We don't need 20 of them, though. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of people miss out on the opportunity to engage in long-term beneficial um, advancement through this unfortunate uh, hyper-diversity that we have. And I hear a lot of excuses for it in terms of, well, we need to control the product. Rubbish. Uh, you, whenever you ask for control, you're usually assuming that you're going to do a better job on your own than a community does together. Uh, I hear people you know, say, well, I want to do it a little bit differently. And quite honestly, that's highly conceited. Um, yes, you may want to do it differently, but is it really going to be that much better? I'm not, you know, also saying that, uh, you know, it's bad to experiment or that, you know, hobby projects are evil and you should only work on, on products that are already there. Or if you have a really radically different idea of how to do things, you shouldn't try it. But I think that we've kind of stepped over that, that balance point um, these days. So let me know what you think uh, in comments, uh, friendly or flamey, it's fine. Both work, although friendly is nicer even if you disagree. So I can find where the bottom third goes. Great. So we'll move on from that bit of philosophication to the Q&A se session, which was really great. Um, I got a number of questions sent in. Thanks to everyone who did so. I really appreciate that. 
Um, uh, Sven Lundkamp actually on IRC says, uh, he says, I think it is much easier to create new desktops now because A, the toolkits are better like Qt5, explaining Maui and Qt Razor, and B, there are companies like Canonical and Google Drive uh, and Google on uh, drive on their their strategy on, and and th those are both true. It's getting easier uh, to make things like desktop environments, and it wouldn't be easier if we had over diversified in the early days. Which means that if we over diversify now, we will end up making things that should be easier in five years harder. Uh, we're not done yet. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I, which is, by the way, one reason why when I saw things like Maui and Cute Razor, and not just me, but other people in the Plasma uh, team, we all thought, well, how can we work together? So uh, I know Martin Graislin has reached out quite a bit to the Cute Razor people when it came to looking at what do we, what could we replace KDM with in Plasma Workspaces 2. We had a meeting with the Maui uh, and Cute Razor people. Uh, so you know, I, I, this isn't simply saying, you know, for me saying everyone stop your projects, uh, but rather, you know, I think we need to all embrace this concept of how can we work together. Um, but I definitely agree. Things that are e th a lot of things are easier now, um, especially with things like Qt and QML. And that naturally will, will create some buoyance um, in terms of diversity. And the other side of it is, yeah, there's companies, but these companies, I think, are extremely short-sighted. They're taking an old model of, of thinking um, I mean, it's basically betting on the Apple and Microsoft model, uh, which is, you know, brand lock-in, uh, consumer control, and make something great with that. Uh, it's almost like they didn't pay attention to what happened in free software and open source. Uh, there's nothing we can do about the companies, you know, unless you're a shareholder or the CEO or on the board of directors. But as uh, their customers, we certainly can. And in the free software world, when we see companies that start to drag things in directions we don't like, we can actually put the brakes on, foot with our feet, and go somewhere that, that makes sense for us. So the Q&A session. So Stephen asked, has the idea of having tabs for folder view ever been considered, or would it likely be impractical? So folder view, for those who don't use Plasma Desktop, uh, we took the desktop layer and we decided we didn't want to show just icons there. In fact, we thought that using the desktop for icons was wasteful. We have gigantic screens and you have a billion files on disk. Uh, the use a desktop as an icon layer was something that first hit the consumer market in 1984 with the Mac. And back then, you, they didn't even have hard drives that you attached to it. It was all floppy disks. And so it made a lot of sense. And these days, not so much. So we decided to take the, the icons off the desktop. Um, we we're really perhaps the first um, main, uh, mainstream you know, traditional desktop to make that leap, although many have since then. Um, and instead, what we did was we made a desktop widget which you can also use full screen, so you can get the old school thing back if you want. But it is, at its heart, a nice little widget that you can resize and put wherever you want on screen. And it can show the contents of a folder. And the folder can be local, it can be remote, it could be um, a desktop search query. So anything that you can uh, view in a file manager or even really in, in um, uh, the search dialog. So he asked, you know, have we ever thought about putting tabs in there? And I guess the idea is while well, we have web browsers that are tabbed, we have file managers that are tabbed, why not uh, folder view? I think it would make folder view a lot more complex in a number of ways. Um, it would make the configuration more complex. It would make it more complex for the average person who's using the system to wrap their head around. Uh, you'd have to work in how does that UI work. But there's a really good answer for this. And that is you can tab any widget you want. There is a grouping desktop containment. So what we also did with Plasma is we said that uh, the things that appear on screen, whether it's on a panel or on the desktop layer or on the dashboard that you can pop up, uh, it isn't just a static, hard-coded layout system. These are also plugins, and they decide how to arrange the content of, say, your desktop. And so there's a grouping desktop containment. You can go into the configuration uh, dialog for your desktop and then pick that as the layout for it, the grouping desktop. And uh, you can then tab or stack 
or put in tile, I guess is what I'm looking for, uh, any set of widgets you want. So you can create multiple folder views and put them into one tabbed group. So I definitely recommend looking at that way. And then we avoid all the problems of it becomes complex, more difficult to maintain, more difficult to configure, which is, I think, kind of a, a, a neat showcase for the design concepts um, inside of Plasma. Um, John Misa wrote, the current K parts technology in KD Libs is a powerful way to reuse portions of Q widget based applications. For instance, the ocular part can be, can be used to embed a document viewer inside another standalone application, such as the Reconc web browser. Is there or will there be an analog to K parts in the LibPlasma or LibPlasma 2 QML world? For example, can a, Q, a LibPlasma 2 application leverage ocular active to display documents? Really good question. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, sort of. So in QML right now, we won't really have it until 5.1. We don't have concepts of some of the traditional desktop elements like toolbars and menus, which is fine for what QML has was originally designed for, which is you know single window or full screen applications. Uh, with Qt 5.1, we're getting the desktop components which introduce, reintroduce some of these concepts and allows you to do traditional desktop applications in QML without any uh, compromise. Um, so with that caveat in place, uh, Ocular, using that example, which is a PDF and document viewer can view all kinds of document formats that uh, comes out of the KDE community. Um, we use that in Ocular Active, or the, yeah, what we call Ocular Active, it's, it just shows up as book reader, really, um, or active reader, um, the binary is called. Uh, it uses Ocular internally, and the way it does this is we have wrapped the uh, necessary bits of Ocular uh, into a usable Q set of QML components. And QML allows you to install such sets of components into disk, and then people simply say import, you know, org.kde.ocular, for instance, and get all the components there. What's missing still, in, a little bit different from K parts yet, besides the fact that obviously we haven't looked at how to work this with toolbars and, and menus, um, is there's no, uh, at least at this point, no um, standardized method of saying, I would like this component from this import, now do whatever you want with my application. You still have to tell it, okay, you know, here I want the, you know, ebook reader uh, element, but put it here in my, my application. With K parts, it's a little more automatic. You just say, load this K part, here's my main window, now go play with the menus and the toolbars. This also has some downsides. Um, you see toolbar and menu bar flicker, sometimes you get multiple items in the toolbar, keyboard conflicts. So I think there's room for improvement there. But we already have the hardest bit, which is how do you share components um, in a very neutral way. And it's, it's kind of one step nicer than K-Parts in the sense that it doesn't require an additional library. It's a core feature of QML. So yes and no. We have something that we already use to do exactly this, um, but there's also some catch-up to do with some of the more advanced desktop -y features that K-Parts have, which I don't think we're going to be able to get to until Frameworks 5 comes out, and, and, at least, and especially Q5.1. Uh, Red Stake Raw wrote in asking, with the recent Google fork of WebKit and Qt Quick 2 using V8, which direction do I think the Qt project contributors will go? Do I think the fork of WebKit will affect KDE in any way? I think it's really too early to say whether that fork will affect anything. WebKit is probably one of the most forky projects ever. Um, it has been forked more times than maybe, maybe it's the world record holder for this now. Um, what often happens is the forks come back and they defork and they, they, you know, usually forks or often forks are used as an experimentation. Um, and either one of two things happens. The rest of the world looks at the experiment and goes, that's a really good idea and everyone adopts that version or, which is what happened with the original WebKit, or um, they look at you know, the, what's in this fork of it and go, those are some really good ideas and fold them back into the main line. Whether that will happen with this or not, it's like way too early to know. I don't know. Um, what will Qt 
quick people do? Well, they're actually, and have been even before this happened, working on a ECMAScript runtime environment uh, to replace the use of V8. And the reason for this is very simple. Uh, JavaScript is, a no, is, a, is not strongly typed. Anyone who's used it knows this. Um, it does have some basic ideas of you know, types kind of somewhere and behind the scenes, but it's not strongly typed. Qt is, and QML also is, so your properties have types. When they're using the generic V8 engine, they have to proxy these objects in, and when they're in the V8 engine, all the type information is lost. So you end up with more memory overhead because you're doing bookkeeping outside of the, the uh, JavaScript environment. Additionally, they proxy in a lot of objects from the C++ Qt. Qstring was the classic example, where when you'd bring a Qstring into QML, and that would also go into the JavaScript environment, and when it did this, it would not only proxy the object, but it used to copy all the string data. And copying data is expensive, especially in small devices. Um, so now they have this all this code in behind the scenes to share the string data, so there's no copying going on. Uh, and this is already in QML1. But it's still not great. They have multiple copies uh, of the same, or multiple representations of the same object. They're not copies of the same object, but they for every one object in QML, there can be as many as three objects, one in Qt, one in the QML uh, bookkeeping, and then one in the V8 engine. Additionally, all the type information is lost, and so you lose a lot of opportunity to do optimizations and sanity checking in the runtime. So they're building a ECMAScript engine uh, I believe they first blogged about it in April of this year. And it's specifically designed for use with QML. So it knows about Qt uh, data, uh, uh, data types, Q object, etc. natively. It is typed internally, which is unusual for a JavaScript runtime, but perfect for QML. And the idea is that they will be able to use the typing information for performance and sanity checking inside the JavaScript runtime or ECMAScript on time, and uh, they'll also be able to reduce a lot of memory overhead, a lot of allocations, and generally make everything faster. I was really concerned when I first heard about this happening. Um, so it's actually really topical to this, this, um, uh, this show where we talked about diversification and over-diversification. I, I was like, oh, no, they're reinventing another wheel. This sucks. Uh, and then... And I looked at why they were doing it, and it started to make sense. And then I saw who was working on it. Um, Lars uh, Knoll, who, yeah, and uh, Seaman Hausman, which are two guys I completely and utterly trust uh, when it comes to these things. They know what they're doing. I mean, Lars is the guy who started what becomes WebKit. So <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Um, I'm fairly confident in that. But that's how that's going to play out. V8 is going to become most likely an irrelevancy. Um, they recently merged there, I think a month ago now, uh, merged their experimental branch um, in with the main uh, Qt repository. It's still in a branch, but it's in the main Qt repository now. So if you want to check it out, you can. Um, Lupo Lupovia. He, that is an awesome name. I wish I had a name that repeated like that. Saig Saigo or something like that. Aaron Aronia. That'd be awesome. Anyways, Lupo Lupovia says, I would like to hear something about the state and future of add-ons. It would be great if add-ons would become really active soon after the D plus active for release. Well, good news. We are planning on doing exactly that. So we are wrapping up uh, right now, actually, the uh, upload and management uh, side of it, both for having your own storefront, should you wish to have a storefront. I need to do a show eventually on, uh, or a segment on the show about Bodega, which is what drives add-ons. It's really cool, because we're not going to be the only ones who can have a storefront. Anyone can have a storefront on their website or wherever they want um, using the, the content that's in the warehouse. Uh, so it's really cool. But the other side of it, being able to upload uh, applications, being able to even use our build service, build.merproject.org, again, very topical given that I covered OBS tonight, our open build service, uh, being able to bring your, your builds from open build service and have them injected directly into uh, the add-ons will be there. And we'll be allowing people, independent authors who are writing um, books or stories, 
there'll be something there for you. Uh, artists, uh, something there for you, as well as application developers. And eventually we'll get to music and the whole bit. But yes, um, when uh, perhaps not when PA4 is released itself, but uh, when at least by, and probably significantly sooner, um, the next, well, we have um, some development timelines that are around two, three weeks um, to get the last bits of this done. Definitely before the Vivaldi tablet ships with it um, and not that long after Plasma Active 4 is released. It's a really important part of it um, and it's also, again, free software and allows multiple people to contribute content and anybody who wishes to, to also have a storefront of their own. Um, and yes, that means if there's things for sale, you get to participate in the whole profit-making business. So really important piece of it, we think, um, especially since all other content stores out there pretty much are proprietary. So in the IRC channel, it's also been going. Um, there's a few questions in there. So uh, Mr. Bolander, he asks, could I comment on OCS and Bodega in terms of diversification? Absolutely. So OCS is the Open Collaboration Services, which was, um, they originally was Katie Look and KDApps.org, and then they added support or versions of the site for, say, GNOME Look and GNOME Apps and XFCE Apps, and I think there's XFCE version of it, and various other ones. Then they put it under an umbrella of OpenDesktop.org. The irony of it was it was all proprietary. And then they took the web API and uh, submitted it to freedesktop.org or via uh, freedesktop.org. There's no really two to submit things there too. And they submitted it via freedesktop.org and, and you know, codified it into a documented API and encouraged other people to use it. So at one point, the uh, people in Migo were uh, doing some work around it to use it. Um, I actually implemented a very small uh, server to push non-compiled updates, so things like scripts and these things, for applications. It was, it's called Synchrotron. It's on, K, on uh, Katie's Git. And the idea is you have a Git repository with all of your you know, add-ons and, and things you need to update in them. And you simply commit to your Git repository, push to wherever you push it to. And then the Synchrotron server notices the push, and it's re or adds whatever's new or updated uh, to the uh, published repository um, via open collaboration services. So you can use OCS to push out updates for scripts and whatnot to your, your clients. Um, I had not used that up until that point. And when I went to use it, I realized that OCS was, to put it kindly, not one of the better designed APIs I've ever seen. So that was one issue with it. I mean, it has things like for previews, it numbers each preview, like preview one, preview two, preview three, preview four, uh, up to like 25 or something like this. Really strangely designed. And I mean, it, it makes sense in the sense that it was kind of organically grown for this, you know, what is a proprietary um, uh, website. So that kind of made sense. The other and more important thing with Bodega is OCS is designed for a centralized collection of content um, that is that really revolves around a, a social media kind of approach. And a bunch of people can put their content in, but there's one central location and there's one central uh, storefront to it all. And while you can use OCS to fetch lists of content, it's still very much kind of more centralized. With Bodega, we wanted to do a few things rather differently. One, we wanted to have something that was, from the beginning, uh, free software. Um, we wanted an API that was reasonably well designed. That typically is not enough, though, to uh, justify a whole other API. Um, we wanted something that wasn't XML. We wanted something that was easier to parse and send across the network, um, more easily used from, say, JavaScript, which is fairly important these days. So we went with JSON. That was one of the really big issues. Um, OCS is XML. They said they were going to move to JSON at some point in the past, and I don't think they ever have. Um, we uh, also were not interested in the social media side of it. You know, We didn't want to create a Facebook 2.0 with it. Instead, we wanted was an actual market where people would be able to provide free or 
for pay content. Uh, and I mean free in terms of gratis. Uh, you can, of course, sell uh, free software as well on it. Um, and we wanted it to be content neutral, but we wanted it to also be compelling for each kind of content. And so the user experience we wanted to deliver with this multiple content uh, provider, multiple storefront, uh, with warehouses that sit in between the two, and the ability to negotiate prices between the storefront, the warehouse, and the content provider, all of these things were really not uh, well suited to, again, that's kind of understating it, to OCS. So we said, fine, let's build something that actually is modern um, and that supports that use case specifically. So it actually does something significantly different than all of the tools that uh, we're using OCS. And I say that as someone who's implemented a server and is quite happy with it that uses uh, OCS. Um, yes. Hopefully that, that answers it. And like I said, I, I need to do maybe in, in, in next uh, next show, maybe episode 14, maybe I'll do a bodega um, uh, segment because I think it's, it is pretty interesting what it does and how it does it differently. Uh, Yohu asks, or Johu, I, you, yes, you can tell I'm spending time in Central Europe when I start pronouncing J's as Y's. Uh, he or she uh, says, are there any plans to split up the monolithic Git repos made in the first phase of the SVN to Git migration? Um, so yes, there are. Uh, many of them already are split up. So things like KDE Games, KDE Edu, um, all elected to be split up. This really concerned me at the beginning because it becomes a lot harder for people to follow and track uh, the repositories. So if you're following KDE games and a new game pops up, and if they're all in separate repositories, how do you ever know? You probably don't. Um, if you want to simply build all the games so you can play with them and test them, if you have to go through 30 different, I think KDE games actually has something absurd, like 50 different repositories. If you're going to build all of those, I mean, that's not a, that's not a five minute job, right? That becomes a Pretty committed hobby, which means the number of people testing would go down. Um, thankfully, we had Michael Pine who came up with uh, KD source build, which I've covered on my YouTube channel actually in a few um, tutorials. That makes checking out all of KDE games super duper simple. So if you want just one KDE game, for instance, you can grab just the one now. Um, but if you want them all, and if you want to track when new ones pop up, you can use KDE source build and get them all. So we kind of have the best of both worlds now between. Uh, monolithic, gigantic Git repositories, but nice um, atomic uh, repositories that are small and easier to check out. If you just work on K jumping cubes, maybe you want just K jumping cubes source. You don't have to deal with everything else. Um, there are a few that remain monolithic because they are really, really hard to figure out how to split them. One was KDE libs. So KDE libs, um, and the other one's another one was KDE runtime. And these actually, the answer to this is the same. So with lib KD libs and KD runtime, they're both going away in frameworks five. And what happens instead is that each uh, topic that's in there, it's not even each library, because a lot of the libraries that are in KD libs are being split into multiple libraries. And each of those libraries will ship with its runtime components, with its own documentation, its own test suite. And the layout for this is actually standardized on um, techbase.k community.kd.org. Uh, in the project area for Frameworks 5, there's policies that define exactly what this directory structure must look like. So we'll have some reliability and some standardization, which is really good. I love that because if I don't have to think, um, okay, I'm working on this new project. I just checked out the source code. Ooh, now the first thing I have to do is spend 10 minutes learning how they laid things out. Uh, beautiful thing about KDE uh, as a big project is consistency. So we've, we're maintaining that. But with Frameworks 5, KD libs and KD runtime are going away. And instead, we're going to have a whole bunch of compartmentalized uh, topic-based Git repositories. So we'll have one for K-Archive that just opens zip files and tar files and bzip2 files. And we'll have another one just for KIO. And we'll have another one for just QWidget add-ons. And we'll have another one for kconfig, etc. cetera. Um, and so those will be split up. For KDE Workspace, which currently houses a good percentage of the Plasma uh, workspace code, all of almost all of Plasma Desktop and Plasma Netbook, for instance, uh, that will also be splitting up. We haven't decided exactly on the structure yet because there's some interplay between libraries there that we haven't quite 
uh, finished separating. Um, but that'll be separated out as well. For people who want to build uh, without tearing their hair out, however, you'll be able to still use KDE source build, for instance, to grab them all at once. So you'll still be able to build just KDE workspace, get everything, or you'll be able to build Quinn. Same thing with the libraries. You'll be able to build all the frameworks, or you'll be able to build K-Archive, or just check out K-Archive. So we, we are working on that. Uh, Yohu asked, asked a follow-up question, what about KDE PIM? There's a reason I didn't talk about KDE PIM, because I don't know. Um, I have not uh, talked to the PIM developers yet about this. I don't know if they have this in mind yet. I would not be surprised in the least if they go a similar route. So they already have KDE PIM libs and KDE PIM runtime. Uh, the individual applications, such as K-Organizer, are already in their own subdirectories within the KDE PIM repository, and then they have Contact, which is the shell that pulls them all together. We also have Contact Active, which does something similarly, and it also lives in the, in the big Contact repository. Um, I would not be surprised if they went the same route that we're going with KDE Workspace, where they do a little bit better separation of their libraries and then break things out. I do know there are libraries already in KDE PIM libs that I want in frameworks, such as the GPGME uh, library that wraps the fairly complex um, GPGME um, or GBG libraries with a really nice, cute style uh, C++ API. And that one's in KDE PIM libs, and that really needs to move into frameworks. So I'm fairly confident that at least parts of KDE PIM libs will be separating into a framework style. And I bet KDE PIM will uh, as well. And Yohu says, thanks for the answer. You're welcome. Uh, I'm excited about frameworks from downstream point of view. I think we all are. Uh, this was, I mean, we, we started work on, you know, modularizing KD libs in the 4.x, but there's only so much we could do before 4.0. And it was already a ton of work. Um, and it only made so much sense because Qt itself was only modularized to a certain extent. Now with Qt 5 being rather more modular, um, and also this division between non-GUI stuff, Q widget stuff, and QML stuff, it really, really, really starts to make sense. Uh, the rise of the multiple platform support that Qt has. Qt's always been great multiple plat multi-platform, but it used to be Windows, Linux, right? That was it. Then Mac, and then Mac got really good, and now we've got iOS and Android that are coming to join the game, and we've got all the different mobile-focused OSs that are using Qt, which I think is you know most of the, the kind of third-party ones, whether it's BlackBerry or, or um, Ubuntu Touch or uh, Mer, or which Plasma Active builds upon. Uh, there, there's a lot of Qt usage out there. So this modularization to allow Qt developers to use it more easily becomes more and more attractive. And I think we'll start to see people being able to use KDE libraries, um, even if they're saying, well, but we primarily deploy on Windows, or we need to deploy easily on Windows, Mac, and Linux, or Android and iOS, whatever. So yeah, I mean, we're excited upstream as much as you guys are downstream, um, and probably for the exact same reasons. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. It's 9 PM, uh, at least here where I am, um, on the dot. And so I will see you once again in two weeks. This has become a bi-weekly show um, due to my schedule at the moment. But we'll see you again in two weeks. I had a great time tonight. I hope you did as well. If this uh, episode jogged some questions in your mind, feel free to drop them uh, on my blog, asigo.blogspot.com, in the YouTube channel, by email, by carrier pigeon, whichever works best for you. Good night, and thanks for showing up.